We have a very cool show for you today. Cody Jennings, owner and founder of Jig Masters, joins us to talk about what all goes in to designing a better jig, pro staff culture, and how to work with businesses on social media. All that and more on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, sponsored by TopFishingDeals.com. Updated daily to provide you with savings on all your favorite gear. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Tackle Talk. We've got a great interview for you today. This time, it's with Cody Jennings of Jig Masters. Jig Masters is a company out of Northwest Ohio that makes really cool and innovative jigs. Uh, So we talked to Cody about what all goes into designing a new jig, uh, how does he do it, what should you look for when you're looking for a jig, and what sets companies like Jig Masters apart from the other big box tackle companies or the one-off jig companies online. We also dive deep into the pro staff culture that's taken over social media and the issues that surround it. So we talked to Cody about uh, what companies actually look for when they're searching for anglers to work with. It's a really cool conversation, and you get to see it from the side of a business owner instead of from the side of an angler, which is the side that we're used to seeing. So this was a really great episode. We'll get to it in just a minute. First, I have to talk to you about topfishingdeals.com. As you know, Tackle Talk is brought to you exclusively by Top Fishing Deals, which is your destination for the best sales and clearance items on the entire internet. So stop digging through bargain bins uh, at your local Cabela's or your local Bass Pro or Academy. Stop going to 12 different websites every day and looking to see what's on sale or what's marked down. Just head over to www.topfishingdeals.com. They do all the work for you, updating the website each and every day to make sure it is filled with the best deals from around the internet from your favorite stores. So whether that is Cabela's, Field and Stream, Bass Pro, Academy, Shop Carl's, uh, Discount Tackle, Tackle Warehouse, any of the other billions of companies that are out there, Top Fishing Deals has you covered. So head over to Top Fishing Deals. Make sure that you're getting the best price on the fishing gear that you're buying anyway. So head over to www.topfishingdeals.com. All righty, let's get to our interview with Cody Jennings from Jigmasters. All righty, so we are joined today by Cody Jennings, uh, owner and founder of Jigmasters. Cody, thanks for joining us, man. Really appreciate it. All right, thanks for having me. So I guess first off, for those of uh, them that are listening that don't necessarily know um, who you are, your background, give us a little bit of backstory on how you got started into fishing, kind of your fishing background and where you're coming from. Yeah, so, um, you know, I was kind of born into fishing. My uh, my dad, who I'm really close with, you know, he uh, fished a lot of tournaments on Lake Erie, you know, fished a lot against a lot of the big guys like Steve Clapper, who's kind of a Lake Erie legend, and, you know, so we had the Salmoids. And, um, you know, so I was kind of just born into it, you know, and, and I didn't go fishing necessarily, you know, I went learning, you know, he's a, he was a very technical and uh, that kind of got passed down. So obviously at some point you must have made the decision where it's like, Hey, I love fishing. I kind of want to get into this industry. I think I have something to offer here. Tell us a little bit about how you took that transition from, you know, uh, angler up there in Lake Erie to an actual, you know, somebody in the industry. And you said, Hey, I want to get into this whole jig making thing. Yeah. You know, so, um, so just a quick little background here. Uh, my mechanical engineering degree from university of Toledo, um, you know, and kind of was working in that field, but, um, so basically I was a person that hated not being busy. Free time is bad for me because I start spending money like crazy. So, um, so basically I used to work 80, 90 hours as an intern a week just to, cause I was paid hourly. And then also I was still, a lot of those times I would be still in 15 to 18 credit hours of classes at, you know, Toledo and, um, uh, you know, so basically when it came time to graduate, I said, crap, I have a bunch of free time now, you know, cause I'm going into a salary role. So it makes no sense to work the 90 hours. And, um, you know, then I don't have the, the college courses anymore, you know? So actually jig masters was going to be basically a YouTube channel, you know, kind of an instructional, you know, uh, you know, channel there, a lot of videos teaching people how to use jigs and stuff like that. And, um, so anyways, I get on the water for the shoot one of my first videos 
and my favorite jig company at the time, which, you know, I won't name any names, um, make a few chaos and stuff like that. And I get the bait back. I'm throwing a, you know, a green pumpkin jig and all of a sudden the paint's chipped and under the green pumpkin paint is black and red. It's like, okay, well, that's odd. Right. So pull out another one, you know, basically, you know, pause it, start the video again off the GoPro and a couple of chaos later, same exact thing, you know, and I'm, I understand sometimes paint chips, stuff like that. I get it. But so basically what was going on is they were going back and repainting some of their old jigs that weren't selling, which I understand, you know, they're saying, Hey, it's easier just to repaint these versus poor new ones, you know, burn new hooks stuff like that. I get it. Um, you know, but basically cure or you cannot cure paint to already cured paint. It's too smooth of a surface. And that's why they were starting to, you know, have the issues where they would, you know, first, second chaos, all of a sudden the paint's knocked up. And, you know, so I contacted them, didn't ask for any freebies or any of that stuff. Just said, hey, look, don't know if you guys know this. You know, I can tell you're repainting jig heads just so you know that's not a viable solution. You know, that it's not going to cure right. You're just going to have quality issues. And instead of, you know, saying, oh, hey, thanks for the tip or whatever. Like I said, wasn't asking for freebies, nothing. That was just trying to, you know, let them know. And, but instead of like not replying at all or anything, they actually kind of sent me a nasty gram back saying, you know, mind your own business. And um, not sure what sparked it or whatnot, you know. And um, right there, I was kind of sitting and I shut the GoPro off and I said, you know what? I think I can do better, you know? And that's really what started the, bait manufacturing idea very cool and then i know the last time that we talked you got a little bit into the engineering that went behind your jig so can you talk a little bit about what jig masters offers as far as jig offerings and what went into designing those because i think that's really interesting yeah you know so i kind of looked at the you know the all the different companies out there all the different products out there and and i wanted to start with a couple of the items that I use all the time. So if a customer comes to me, I have some form of knowledge base, right? And so anyways, I said, okay, well, I'm going to start with flipping football and like pivot heads or wobble heads, some people call them, um, you know, those type of jigs. And so I'm looking at, I'm going through Tackle Warehouse. I'm going, you know, looking at Bass Pro, looking at all these places. And they start to realize like 95% of the jigs out there are sold by several companies, the exact same one, you know, not even a small tweak outside of, you know, color differences, stuff like that. But as far as the head design, you know, they're all similar. And, um, you know, that's kind of what should, at that moment kind of showed me that, hey, if I really want to break into this industry, I got to be different. And, you know, once again, with the engineering background, you know, I thought, hey, I, I, I can do this, you know. And, um, you know, so really the process is, is, you know, I'm going to say, what are the top five, you know, angler favorites of flipping jigs? Let's look at even with those, what are the pros, what are the cons? And then let me design out the cons, you know, and uh, that's how I, I start a lot of that stuff, you know, identify what needs to be added into the market. Um, you know, to help customers, you know, whether it's lose less jigs or, you know, give a little bit pre better presentation underwater, you know, all these things, you know, identify those issues and then, and then fix them on my end. So if you go to like jigmasters.com and you look up your signature jigs are the ones that I specifically want to talk about too. They're very unique looking. They're very, I would almost call them very industrial looking. Can you talk a little bit as to when you went to design this jig and you took a look at all these other jigs that were on the market that, like you said, all look very similar, all look like they're probably cookie cutter of some sort. What led you to the design that you ultimately ended up with? Yeah. So, um, you know, as you're describing it, that would be the signature flipping jig. And, um, you know, and basically what I thought about, I said, okay, what's really good at coming through, you know, timber and stuff like that. And a few things came to mind. Well, on the crankbait, side you got square bills right and that's because you kind of got that blunt you actually got a blunt edge hitting the log versus you know a tapered style of a standard crankbait um and then also too you know i said okay well why do jigs hang up 
And if you do some underwater studies and stuff like that, whether it's in a bait tank or you're in a quarry or something or somewhere with clear water, um, you know, what happens with most flipping jigs or quote unquote skipping jigs, whatever, is when they hit the bottom, they actually fall to the side. And when a jig falls to the side, you're not worried about just the thickness of the hook on, you know, potentially snagging, which is obviously small. You know, it's one, one and a half millimeters. You're actually worried about the gap of the hook, you know, which the gap is going to be somewhere up to almost an inch, you know, for most flipping jigs. So, you know, that's a two, let's say 2,500% increase in, in potential snagging, you know, a zone right there, right? So that's why on that, I have that huge stand up flat on it. So when that jig hits the bottom, you know, it's got a, it's about a 60 degree angle, but it is standing up, you know, but it's not going to fall over. And uh, that's really what led to that. How long was the testing process for that whole thing? So, um, and there's actually one more feature on it too, um, that I actually increased a little bit off of the original model, but actually that's part of that whole quote unquote boxy look. So if you actually look at the back face of my jig there's actually basically just a big rectangle and actually what that that flat surface allows you to do is actually skip them very easily you know because that was one of my issues is hey i want to get under this dock way back under there and you know skipping with a bait caster is already scary enough you know <laughs> you know one little issue goes wrong you know you got a backlash that might just make you put that reel down for the day um, you know, so that way there's that big box flat on there too. And, um, but yeah, as far as, you know, the whole, whole design process, you know, is, uh, you know, I started with the 3d modeling side and, you know, that roughly took, you know, the first prototype took anywhere from, you know, one to two weeks to kind of, you know, work out. And then basically it was, I spent about three to four months of me and then a couple other locals and stuff, you know, that I trust their opinion on, let's put this thing through the works, you know, and what happens a lot of times when people try baits or whatever, and I mean more on the company side, not all companies, but a lot of people, they say, well, let's see if this jig works. And then they go fish it in wide open water. Well, that doesn't help me any, you know, Hey, I, it works in wide open water. There's nothing to snag. Right. So I spent basically three to four months trying to throw it in the nastiest timber or docks or whatever that I could fish. Um, and made sure that the other people test them, you know, say, hey, I'll, don't worry about losing the jig. I want you to try to lose it. Now, in the water, I don't mean you go throw it into a, you know, a woods, you know, 50 feet off the bank. But, you know, but I, I want you to try to lose these. And let's see how good or bad it does. And the feedback was, was very positive. Um, now, from there, there were a few few little bit easier issues and stuff to overcome, you know, getting a jig to not hang up in timber, that's a hard feat. But, um, you know, after that, some of the things were small additions, like getting the better, like a better skirt keeper on there and, you know, getting the weed guard angle dialed in a little bit better and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, so overall, especially on that first one, you know, it was about a eight month process. And that kind of leads us into our next thing. What would you say are the most important components of a jig? So like anybody that's listening to this, that they're out there looking for, I, I spent a ton of time looking for the right jigs for certain situations. What are, what are a couple of the main things that you look for when you look for a jig? Yeah. You know, so one of the biggest things and everybody dwells on stuff like that is, uh, you know, the hook, you know, um, what happens, and once again, like I said, I'm not going to name names of other companies, stuff like that, but a lot of times people say, you know, for let's just say a 60 degree flipping hook, there's 15 different brands out there that sell that exact dimensional hook. And oftentimes what happens is, you know, as most companies do, or if somebody's got more of a finance background, they're going to say, well, heck, they're, they're, they look the same. Give me the cheapest one. Now, I'm not saying you have to go to the most expensive one, but um, what I am saying is that you should do some form of, um, I actually did like tensile testing. So I actually got to find the yield and ultimate of, you know, all these different versions and stuff and uh, kind of find, 
found the a very high performing but also budget friendly hook because I don't want to try to sell jigs for eight dollars to make a dime. You know, that's not my that's not my uh, my spiel. You know, right? Um, you know, so honestly, having a quality hook that's huge, um, and then also having a head design that, like I said again, you know, that won't fall over on you. And anytime you get those, you know, receipts, sometimes people, you know, flip with almost like a, almost like a swim jig style, like a casting jig, uh, stuff like that. You know, a lot of times you're asking for bad news bears, you know, that thing's going to hit the bottom and just flop over. Um, and then outside of that, it's just going to be on the, the skirt keeper side. You know, um, a lot of people get insanely hung up that that weed guard needs to sit right on the hook and it actually, you can have a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, it's actually, it's actually less important once you have a jig that will not roll over. Um, now you want to keep it close. I'm not saying just either have it not there or have it, you know, an inch away from the point of the hook. Um, but I, I actually prefer to keep it just slightly off. And uh, what happens is it allows the fish to, you know, as soon as they get past that, what happens a lot of times is the hook, you know, obviously goes through their, you know, their lip and stuff like that. And then the weed guard is on the outside and almost kind of pens it, you know, so they can't, they can't spit it super easy. Got it. And you just talked uh, a little bit about hook choice, which I think is very important too. I think that's probably my number one. What hook did you guys settle on uh, in your jigs? I think that's always important and people are interested in knowing yeah, 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 for sure. So pretty much, um, like I said, I did a lot of tensile testing. You know, I went all the way up to, you know, the Gamagatsus of the world, the, you know, the Trocars, and then all the way down to some random generic name, you know, Bob's Hook, you know, <laughs> you know whatever. Um, but pretty much everything that, uh, that tested uh, how I wanted it to came through Mustad. So at least as of now, everything I, I do so far is, is through Mustad hooks. Yep. I, uh, when I went down the deep, dark path of trying to make my own jigs a couple years ago, that's the one I ended up with too, the Mustad Ultra Points. I absolutely loved them. They were just, like you said, for the money, the strength, the sharpness that they, you know, they keep their point. I'm, I'm a big fan. So that's awesome that, uh, that's what you guys settled on too. That's cool. Um, Okay, so we did an episode a couple weeks ago, or actually probably a couple months ago now at this point, um, about making your own jigs. And there are a lot of people, I think, that were kind of in my shoes, too, and um, yours back at one point, too, where it was like, hey, I'm interested enough to try my hand at making my own jigs or melting my own lead or, you know, maybe if it's just making uh, small jig heads for, you know, grubs or something like that, where just someone gets curious and wants to to start. And we put out some tips and uh, some stuff to get people started. But one thing I think a lot of times we gloss over is the potential dangers that are associated with making your own jigs and melting your own lead and stuff like that. Where do you sit on this issue? Because I know people that melt lead in their living room with their baby around and i know people that you know wear a hazmat suit and wash their clothes right afterwards where do you sit on i guess the the safety issues or precautions you should take when melting lead yeah you know so uh definitely wouldn't do it in the living room <laughs> now uh, now i understand sometimes people don't have an option right you know depending on you know, what, what their living uh, quarters are uh, but pretty much I've converted my single car garage um, strictly for jig masters. You know, the only thing that's not we have a water softener out here and, um, you know, a washer and dryer. And I'm trying to actually move the washer and dryer out of here for more space. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so, you know, it's the garage. And, you know, if it's nice out, you know, obviously garage doors open, back doors open, you know, stuff like that. Um I do recommend, you know, and obviously as you do more and more and more, you know, you'd want to bump up to a true exhaust fan or something like that and actually, you know, pump it out of the, the room, um, you know, outside basically. Um, but, you know, at least at minimum, you know, get a decent fan, have it set up to where it's not blowing, it's actually sucking the fumes through the fan and then blowing it away from you. Um, if you actually have it, most people, they do it the other way. And all it does is actually just kind of expands it out. It doesn't really get it away from you, you know, but um, I wouldn't say like, th there's never such thing as being too careful. 
Um, you know, some of it, you have to be realistic though. You know, if you're going to make jigs and you're just making them for yourself, are you going to spend the $1,500 and getting a good exhaust fan, getting a good, you know, uh, ventilator mask, getting a good, you know, all these things, you're going to spend that much money. That's unrealistic, right? You know, if you're going to spend that much money, you might as well just go buy them. Um, you know, so it, it's a balance and it also depends on, am I making 10 a week? <laughs> Or am I making, you know, 500 a day, you know, or a thousand a day or whatever, you know? So um, I try to be as calculated as possible, you know, without breaking the bank and stuff. I hear you. I have a 3M respirator and a decent pair of gloves and that's all I've got. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's more than most, right? You know, and, yeah. um, and one of the things too, I recommend it's not that expensive to do. I do it literally at least once a month is get your uh, blood lead levels tested. You know, that is one thing, like I said, it's it's not that expensive and you don't have to do it as much as I do it. I'm just making jigs all the time. I like to be precautious, um, you know, but hey, if you're gonna have a, you know, your annual checkup or whatever, you know, at least have it tested and get kind of a baseline. You know, if you get a test and you're, you're way high, you say, well, the only lead I'm really exposed to is the jig making. I probably need to uh, make some changes out in the shop, right? Or you say, hey, it's extremely low and I'm good. Do you get that done at your like family practice or uh, urgent care or something? Uh, so I just typically, um, I've just done it anytime I've ever went to the hospital and stuff. Now it actually, I've kind of got some medical issues, so I go often. So, uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you can pretty much get it done at, you know, just uh, your local hospital or whatnot. Um, Sometimes, basically, if I'm not going for anything else, you know, my doctor kind of is, you know, my family physician, you know, is fully aware of, you know, what I do and stuff. They just write an order and I go get it done at like a path labs or something like that. You know, walk in five minutes, you're out. That's cool. That's a that's a good idea. It's something I never even thought of was, you know, I don't think I do it enough, but I know some people listen to the show that definitely do melt quite a bit of lead and that's probably a good idea maybe even just once a year or something just go and get it checked and you know tested and like you said can't be too careful but it's always one of those things where you hear you know multiple different sides you hear people that aren't worried about you know the lead and the fumes at all and then you hear people that are like hey you know it's it's a serious issue and you have to take it um you know every precaution possible so it's it's nice to hear you're somewhere in the middle i just kind of wanted your perspective on that the, one of the things too honestly that you can do to help yourself um is actually try to get as close of pure lead as possible. Um, you know, so which is harder to do in some cases, but you know, the more and more slag that's in there generating, that's typically there's a direct correlation to how many fumes it's throwing every time you're melting it. You know, so um, so that's something to, to always watch out for. Um, and then you can also use stuff like uh, clean cast. Um, you know, so there's some different compounds you can mix in there that actually will, it'll catch, you know, basically force all the slag and one's bad stuff, but it doesn't smoke. So basically don't use, uh, wheel weights is what you're saying. <laughs> wheel weights actually aren't as terrible as people think. Um, really? A lot of times actually the worst load you can get often is fishing lures. A lot of times, you know, um, you know, when, when people go melt, uh, you know, if you just go buy the one pound, you know, ingot from, you know, whomever, you know, name, you know, a bunch of different distributors, those are often only like 65 to 70% lead. Um, wow. So yeah, typically your, your non-fishing store sources of lead are your better lead. Interesting. Learn something new every day. I figured wheel weights were probably like the worst thing you could use. Yeah, they're they're actually pretty high. They're about ninety to ninety five percent lead. Okay, so there's two kind of um, topics I wanted to talk to you about because I want kind of your perspective on this coming from someone that actually owns a company, somebody that um, you're very active on, you know, social media and the, the internet and things like that. And just the way the world's going nowadays, I kind of wanted to pick your brain on these two topics. So first um, we talked about it a little bit already, but as a lure maker who is, is interesting to talk to because you're doing it the right way, right? You designed your own lures. It's a hundred percent, you know, original, you did the, the R and D um, do other companies that you see out there. I can think of like, 50 right off the bat that you see on the internet that are just they're using do it mold brush jigs they're using do it mold you know football jigs and the archie style jigs and then they're kind of 
selling them as their own and all they're really doing is powder painting them and throwing a skirt on them. Does that bug you at all from somebody that actually put in the work to design a lure the right way? No, it, it, it doesn't bug me because it helps me. You know, um, you know, kind of how I look at it, and I try to explain this to um, actually a friend, and it was about a different business that they were kind of interested in. Um, you know, but what I tried to explain them because they asked me, it's like, well, why are you spending all this time designing jigs and getting custom molds machine, which are way more expensive than buying new molds, you know? <laughs> Um, you know, even if you do work in some preferred pricing, it's still, you know, at minimum, you're in the realms of 10 times more expensive up to, in all honesty, 50 times. Um, you know, and then, uh, what I tried to explain them, I said, you know, most, not all, but most industries of today are flooded, you know, and that's just, there's a lot of people, you know, I mean, it's kind of the natural progression. You know, uh, one person says, hey, this guy's making money selling jigs. All of a sudden, there's 10 companies, 100 companies, 1,000. You know, it grows exponentially. And what that means is it doesn't mean that you can't make it in that industry. It means that you have to be better and you have to be different. And basically how I tell people is there's no room. Same thing for YouTube videos, you know, the channels and stuff to take off. You know, there's no room anymore for mediocrity. You know, you have to go above and beyond, like I said, be different and, uh, you know, do things the right way. You know, a lot of times where, you know, you go back through, you know, YouTube videos, you know, used to, you could post a blurry video that had terrible audio and it would get a bunch of likes and everybody was happy about it. Right. Anymore, it's got to be a Hollywood production damn near to uh, really get any views, you know. And once again, that's just because there's so many people making okay videos you know that's interesting take on it too then so you basically feel that the i don't want to call them mediocre but like the, you know the 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 other jig manufacturers out there the other jig companies that aren't necessarily taking the time to put out something different original better than what's already been out there they're just, they're just kind of elevating companies like you that are actually pushing the envelope that are doing it the right way they just you know make you look better in contrast that's it's a, a good way to look at it i think yeah, you know, and, and one thing, too, that a lot of times people struggle to realize is there's a bunch of different concepts for what the company wants to do. You know, is it strictly just a fun, you know, hobby almost, you know, that makes you, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year um, that you're never going to take full time? You know, it's always just going to be a hey, after hour kind of thing. That's fine. Or are you trying to really push the envelope and eventually, you know, become a, you know, significantly large company? Um, you know, what I try to tell people is I'm not trying to get rich quick. You know, this is a long-term business plan. This is what I want to be doing, you know, and, um, and not everybody wants to, you know, so that's one thing that everybody assumes. I think, oh, you own a business, you want to become a billionaire. That's not always the case. Um, you know, a lot of times people, they just do it to do it, you know, so there's that too. And it's so funny because you just kind of described me perfectly too, because a couple years ago when I started making my own jigs, I was like, wow, these are so much better than the ones I just get out of the big box stores. If you're going to go buy, you know, an XPS jig from Bass Pro or something, you know, they're, they're cheap components. They're not great. And I was like, I wonder if I can sell these. And then you start trying to sell them and then, you know, you do okay. But like you said, then you realize you're like, I'm using the same mold everybody else is. There's really nothing setting me apart. You're competing with yourself a thousand times over. And that's where people like you are going to shine because there is, when you see your signature flip and jig, when you see something like that, you're like, wow, that is different. That is innovative. That is something that catches your eye. And you remember that as opposed to the sponsored Instagram ad you saw that's like, oh, that's a do it mold brush jig i've seen those a thousand times so <laughs> something that, uh, that i always keep in mind too is um you know and that's kind of why i you know really spend a lot of time too on the you know the packaging side is important you know um not only having a product that you know has been designed doesn't look like others on the market and i'm not saying every product i do looks like a you know an alien you know um, you know, there's some things that are typically small tweaks just to help anglers out, you know, whether it's a better trailer keeper, you know, a uh, little bit of tweak here and there, you know, but some stuff are huge design overalls, like the buzz bait, the flipping jig, uh, you know, my, my pivot head, you know, stuff like that, you know, um, but, you know, I spent a lot of time on, you know, the packaging side too, because when these baits are in a store, I'm not there to push them. 
you know, and, uh, you know, so a, you know, if you grab the eyes of somebody saying, Oh, that packaging looks cool. I'm going to go walk over there. You know, the display looks nice. And then they walk over and they say, Oh, that looks different. I'm kind of curious now, you know, then they try it. And then, Hey, you know, is if your product, you know, is good and, you know, the design was done correctly and the prototyping went also like that, you know, typically they have a good experience with it. And then it grows from there. You know, you've got that customer for, you know, long term, and now they're starting to tell a few of their buddies, you know, so and then it kind of grows exponentially there too. So the other side of this whole kind of, I guess, conversation on where the inter- industry is going, like you said, everything is getting so YouTube heavy, Every getting everything's getting so online and social media. The kind of dark side of this that you're starting to see now is this whole culture around like pro staffs and sponsorships and things like that where it's it just seems like it's every person between age 14 and 30 just wants to be sponsored and I'm putting air quotes up for those of you that can't see me or you know be on a pro staff and you know then it leads to let's say there's a company called Boo Tungsten and let's say Boo Tungsten, you know, uh, marks their product up 10% and then gives anybody that asks a 10% discount code to be on their pro staff and, you know, try and sell this product to their friends and family. What does, you know, what, what is your feeling on that? Do you think that there's any issue with that or any immorality to like that side of the business that seems to be kind of rearing its ugly head more and more? Yeah, so if you go way back to what the pro staff system used to be, the first issue with it is it's a very confusing word. It means promotional staff, not professional staff. That was already the the bad start to it. However, prior to social media, what pro staff was, was a lot of your charter and guide services, and then also your mid to high level, and I'm not talking elite series, but, you know, just below it, you know, but mid to high level tournament anglers. And the, the beauty of that back then was, I'll use an example here, is let's say somebody fishes Erie and literally the only thing they catch fish on, which obviously, you know, not true, but only thing they caught fish on was this brand of tube. That person has no benefit of getting on a pro staff of a spinnerbait company. It doesn't save them any money, <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, because like I said with guides and charters and, you know, mid to high level tournament anglers, they depended on those discounts to be able to make some form of profit at the end of the year. You know, if they paid full price and everything, you know, the amount of tackle that they have to carry and amount of tackle that they're losing, or if you're a guide service that the people you're taking is losing, um, you know, those discounts played a big role on them being profitable. So when that guide service, you know, captain, whatever, when he told you, hey, I throw uh, Joe Bob's tubes, and these are the three colors I like, you as a customer, or even if it's a buddy, or you hear it from him at a store, whatever, you know, anywhere on the street, whatever, um, you knew it was coming from an honest place. That's not the case anymore because now it has become way more of a status thing that, you know, you go click on so-and-so's profile and they're a pro staff on 16 companies. You know, like I said, it's, and I'm not saying that's everybody out there, but there is a vast majority of people who um, I can't remember who told me the term, but I thought it was funny. They, they came with the term patch pirates, you know, and um, yeah. And unfortunately it's a real thing, you know, and um, that was the whole side of the business that I didn't even think about when I started, you know, and then when I did hear like, Oh yeah, well, yeah, I've kind of heard of pro staff before and stuff like that, you know, Okay, great. So yeah, okay. So I'll probably get some people on and you know, join everybody else and yeehaw. Um, and then I had a couple, you know, it's just for giggles, you know, I added, you know, three to four people, whatever. And you know, they were asking for free stats. Like, well, guys, you know, I'm I'm too small to give up too much free stuff, you know. 
Um, I said, you know, hey, look, you know, we'll do these discount codes. We'll kind of track to see, are you pushing sales? And it's not the perfect system, but it gives you an idea, right? Well, the issue was four months, five months down the road, none of those codes were ever used, you know? And, and once again, I'm not talking everybody. I'm talking about the specific people that originally joined. So as I look at that from a business owner, it's like, well, I need to know there's some return on investment. You know, if I give you 10 free jigs, that doesn't mean I should expect only five sold. You know, that's a, that's a net loss, right? You know, so you got to kind of start, you know, thinking about that stuff. And, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of the bigger companies, um, you know, that aren't doing the quote unquote boo tungsten way, you know, that still do have a moderately small pro staff system, something like that. One of the things are is they already have a, a big share of the marketplace and they have a big, big quote, unquote, marketing budget, you know, that they want to make sure it at least come close to spending. It's, it's just a big company thing. So they don't necessarily always track it as close as maybe I have. Um, you know, so what then started happening was after, you know, oh, hey, you know, I put the quote unquote team Jigmaster um, page up on the website. And then all of a sudden, phone just starts buzzing. Once again, this is a year and a half ago. I'm an extremely small company at this point, which I'm still a small company, less small, we'll put it that way. Um, you know, just bombarded with people asking for either free stuff or asking, you know, to get on the pro staff, you know, and it's just, it was just everywhere, you know, and it started driving me crazy, you know, and I had no good method on looking at an Instagram profile or whatnot and telling, would this person be good or bad? And, you know, so some companies, which I will give them some credit, said, okay, well, we can't tell who's good or bad, so let's invite everybody. And I would say that they've been successful with that. You know, yeah. um, unfortunately, I don't charge enough for my jigs to kind of take up that system, you know. Um, you know, so, um, but yeah, and then a lot of the, you know, the people reaching out and stuff like that, you know, there were some that would, you know, have a resume put together or, you know, give you some good info or insight on, hey, this is, you know, what, how I got into fishing. This is, you know, what I think I could bring to your company. And that's huge. You know, I would I would tell everybody if they want to seek pro staff positions and stuff is have some form of, you know, fishing resume put together and, you know, really focus on what you can do for them. It's pretty simple math. You know, if I give you two hundred dollars and all you give back to me is 50, my business isn't going to do well. You know, I have to be profitable. You know, so I really think that people uh, should really spend a lot of time on that. You know, um, it doesn't necessarily matter if you're the best angler on your local lake or if you're catching huge fish on farm ponds or whatever. You know, at the end of the day, it says, can you move the needle for this company? If the answer is no, or you're not even worried about that, you know, it's probably not going to work out. Um, and in today's world, once again, you know, social media, when it first started, you saw several people, you know, become quote unquote influencers. And when they did post stuff, it did move the needle. They got, you know, these big 100,000, 200,000, you know, followers, stuff like that. And it worked great. Once again, now it's flooded again. You know, so if everybody from, you know, these high level social media influencers to, you know, the, no offense, you know, the 12 year old kid fishing a farm pond. If you have this full range and everybody's on pro staffs, everybody's just throwing out company names. You go to your local body of water, you see somebody catching a fish on just for I'll throw out a random example, catching a fish on a spinner bait, taking the spinner bait out and putting a jig in its mouth and then taking the photo, um, you know, what happens is it's not from an honest place anymore. You know, everybody knows that, hey, these are all just kind of marketing schemes compared to once again, back in the day when, you know, you saw a picture of a fish, hey, it was caught on this, 
you knew they weren't lying, you know? Um, and I've kind of, I'm started to transition almost fully transitioned away from it. You know, it's, um, you know, I'm kind of on an Island out here, you know, trying to do it, but at the same time, you know, just back to the, you know, designing my own jigs and stuff like that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this, you know, this different idea will, uh, will benefit long term. And that's, it's really interesting you say that too, because I'm, I sort of come from the opposite side of it where I, you know, I'm, I, I like to fish. I like to take pictures. I like to use Instagram and post things and stuff like that. But I, from day one, I had kind of a, I don't know, I saw that kind of stuff and it was more of like a less is more, uh, mentality. And you kind of hinted at it there too, but it's like, if, if your end goal is to get sponsorships, get whatever, you know, make a, you know, a side hustle or a living or whatever you want to do off of some of this stuff, then less is more. If you have 30 pro staff positions, you don't provide value to anybody. Your, your feed is flooded with everything. You know, that was a thing that I had an issue with too. It was like, I just like fishing and taking pictures. Like the last thing I want to do is have to go out and think, oh man, I need to get a picture today of this, this, and this. Like that ruins the fun. Um, it's the reason that I never got into videos in general because I thought that took away from the fun of fishing, let alone now you go out with a checklist of things that you have to take pictures of and post and keep a schedule and try and keep everybody happy. Like it just, it takes the the whole fun out of the sport. And I think that's something that, when people first get started, they think they want, and then they slowly realize, like, hey, this is this is not fun. This is not what I signed up for. Yeah, you know, and, and you always want to keep it fun, you know. Uh, you don't want fishing to necessarily become your job, you know. Um, you know, and something that, you know, kind of an interesting story is I get a call it's from this guy in Kentucky. I'll give him a little shout-out here, Ethan Lewis. He's a state trooper down in uh, London, Kentucky. Um, get a call. Can't even understand the guy. I had to get, pick up on his accent real quick, which I've been around Southern accents, you know, but it's pretty thick. Um, but I started picking it up and he's just saying, Hey man, I bought some of your jigs and I absolutely love these things. Is there any way to get kind of on the pro staff and stuff? And for the fact that he actually called versus DM'd or whatever, like, okay. And at this time I was pretty fed up because I had a decent sized pro staff team um, and just, you know, very minimal, you know, needle moving, right? And I was kind of at that time, still before coming up with the system I've kind of transitioned to, I said, you know, screw it. I'll give him a shot. Look at his, you know, I told him, hey, yep, let me, uh, you know, kind of send me just for giggles, you know, some of your social media accounts and stuff like that. So I can check him out. I said, but yeah, I would, I, you know, I, I think we can do something. And never approached me for free stuff, nothing. He just said, you know, I, I want to help Jigmasters grow. Cool. Love it. Um, you know, which I, you know, I gave him a decent discount and stuff like that. And that's kind of grown over the year. But anyway, so I had this team of six people prior to then over any, for anywhere like five to six months, can't remember the exact amount of time. Um, you know, like three sales were pushed via their codes, you know, this kid comes along. I check out his Instagram, 31 followers, not many. Right. And then you click on the followers, you know, half of them are the, you know, cute animals and, you know, stuff like that, that, you know, adds every new account, you know? <laughs> so out of the 31, there's probably at that time, now it's grown since then, you know, but at that time there's probably 15 to 18 people. Right. And first week or first week and a half, he's pushed 10 sales. So I'm like, well, you know, I've got my head scratching, you know? So I call him, I said, dude, what are you doing? And he's, he's kind of like, what? You know, I said, I'm not, I, I'm not mad. I'm trying to figure out so I can kind of teach the others or, you know, something for a learning lesson for me. You know, what are you doing that's helping push these sales? And it was simple. He says, I'm just talking to people or, you know, telling them. And it's like, yeah, duh, you dummy. You know, yeah, it obviously works, you know, where, uh, you know, we've lost a lot of the personal touch anymore with social media. Um, and I'm not saying social media is evil because I couldn't do what I've done so far without it. You know, I don't have this big lofty marketing budget, you know, stuff like that. It let me, you know, get my foot in the door of a lot of places by, you know, posting and, you know, kind of learning some of those tools. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm extremely thankful for that, but there are obviously the dark side of it too. 
Um, but yeah, you know, it's kind of, it was just like, well, duh, you, yeah, that works, you know, cause people want that personal touch in a world where they don't get it often anymore, you know? So yeah, it was, uh, yeah, like I said, a big, big shout out and, uh, you know, love working with him stuff like that. You know, he's a cool dude. Well, and that kind of brings us to our last, uh, question here too. There's, there's probably a lot of people out here that are listening that are hoping to at some day. Um, work with companies or, you know, have some sort of relationship with a company like yourself or somebody else out there, what advice would you give to someone listening to this, that, that, you know, to provide as much value as they can to a company like you? Yeah, you know, um, one of the things, like I said, when reaching out, you know, kind of really think through what can I do that's, you know, whether it's a little bit different or, you know, what can I provide the company? And, the answer of, hey, I'll wear your clothes and post pictures in it, that's not good enough anymore, you know, because that's what everybody's doing, you know, and, um, you know, a lot of it is, uh, you know, learning to be a little bit more social, you know, if you're at a boat ramp and you're waiting or whatever in line to, you know, to back the truck and you see a couple of guys at the dock or a couple people in their boats, you know, putting tackle away or whatever, you know, approach them and talk to them, you know, and if you have a jigger or whatever in your hand, you know, kind of show them and stuff. And a lot of times those are going to be the way you drive sales. Um, you know, your, your conversion rate is so much higher. Yeah. You might reach three to 500 people on a post on social media, but if nobody orders it, it didn't matter. You know, <laughs> what I try to, what I try to get people to understand is I can't go to the bank with likes. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's sales, 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 you know. Um, but yeah, I really think practicing on the, uh, you know, making sure you're social, you know, kind of the personal touch stuff. Um, and two, and this is a big one. If you've never used company X's stuff, don't jump on their pro staff. That's a big glowing, you know, dark sign there, right? So, you know, and I, it's, I would say in all honesty, 90 or 85 to 90% of the people that reach out to me, you know, whether it's say, hey, send me some, you know, free stuff, blah, 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 whatever. Or, you know, hey, I want to get on your pro staff. You know, first question is, is, well, have you tried any of these? And more than not, that answer is no. Okay, well, if the answer is no, the, you know, how do you know they're a good product? You know, that's the issue right there. You know, everybody just wants to push product versus focusing on, hey, is this actually a good company? Um, and I've known plenty of times where they get on the pro staff and they still don't use the stuff. They just want to say, hey, I'm on X's pro staff. Which makes zero sense. That's the polar opposite of the way someone should be looking. Why would I want to work I mean, you, you really are. Why would I want to work for a company that I don't like, I don't care about, I have no uh, identity with whatsoever, I've never used their products? Why do I want to devote time or effort or anything to promote something that I just don't know or don't care about? Like, it's it's so ass backwards of why am I, why are people reaching out to you to work for you on your behalf for something that they've never used it's, it just blows my mind it's so backwards and it should be the opposite way where if you have a following if you have influence if you have worth then you know you should be the one providing something to these companies companies should be reaching out to you it should be the polar opposite so it's 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 a really interesting dynamic where usually the people that are reaching out to the companies aren't the ones that can provide value. The companies finding people and reaching out to them is where a lot of times the value to a company is built. So it's, it's a really interesting kind of, like I said, just ass backwards uh, time that we're in right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree, you know, and, um, you know, one of the things too is when, you know, when you're working with companies and stuff, you know, it doesn't have to be a one-sided relationship, you know, um, you see it and I see it both ways, right? You know, so sometimes, you know, the, uh, the pro staff or whatever, you know, if the, if the company owner or whatever doesn't know and they don't know how to handle a situation, it's one of those, Hey, you ask, I give, you know, um, you know, it's one sided, you know, the uh, quote unquote pro staffer is really taking advantage, but there's also the other way, you know, is, Hey, you've pushed, uh, you know, 
hundred thousand dollars of sales in these last two years. And all I give you is a 10% discount. Okay. Uh, you know, you kind of got to wait through those waters, you know, and, and one of the things that I always try to do, um, and you should be able to, it, it's actually pretty easy to tell on, you know, who's kind of moving the needle for me and stuff like that, because I'm trying to hype them up too. You know, it's, uh, we can both grow at the same time. I, I agree with that. And then the, you, you kind of, uh, alluded to it too, but one of the things that someone told me a long time ago, um, was if you are going to approach a company as a, I hate the term, but like as an influencer or as a, you know, somebody that has a social media following, treat it like a job interview. Cause that's, that's really what it is. So like the very first time I ever reached out to a company that I, when I finally felt like I had built somewhat of a following of people that liked looking at my fishing pictures, um, I reached out, I had a cover letter, I had a, like, here's almost like a proposal, like, here's what I think I can do for you, and here's what I think would be relatively fair in return, and then it kind of lays out both sides, and that, that's completely how I approached it, it, was like I was interviewing for a job, and the person that I reached out to reached back out to me, and they said, hey, you got, like, a third the followers we usually look for, but the fact that you reached out, that you seem committed, that you took the time to actually draw up, you know, and, and see that this is a two-sided relationship and what you can provide to us and what we can provide to you, we'll give you a shot. And I think that's something that a lot of people need to, to look into too, is like, you don't just send a, a random DM that says, can I, you know, will you sponsor me? Like, that's not, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah, no. And um, it's always, it's always beautiful when you get the uh, copy and pasted messages, you know, where they rapid fire the same message to, you know, a hundred companies. You know, sometimes they forget to change the name on there and all of a sudden it pops up of, hey, we'd love to work with you, Strike King. It's like, well, that's weird because I'm not Strike King. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I've seen that a lot, you know. Busted. Uh, like I said, just, just you know, be real. Don't do the copy and paste thing. Um, now, it also shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't have to get jig masters tattooed on your, your chest or your arm to be able to work with me. But basically, you know, what companies are typically looking for, or at least me, is, hey, show me some form of reasonable amount of effort. If your effort was copy and pasting a message and you didn't even take the time to switch the company's name in it, yeah, it's going to be a no from me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but if you did, like you know, like you said, hey, you know, maybe you don't have a huge following, but you sent out a, you know, a cover letter, a little resume or something, say, you know, hey, this is what I'd like to try. Um, you know, a lot of times it doesn't have to be crazy. You, know, you can even say like, hey, look, let's work together for three months and go from there. Let's see, you know, hey, if I'm not providing value, you know, let's figure out why or agree to part ways and life moves on, you know, and, and that's one of the, the final parts of it all is everybody needs to not be so insanely emotional. If you're told no, because like I said, right now I'm going through 50 to 60, whether it's DMs, emails, whatever, you know, together about 50 to 60, you know, messages a week. I have to say no to somebody. You know, um, and it's not necessarily that I think you're a bad person or stuff like that, but, you know, I have to do some form of, hey, if I see this, I'm probably going to say no. Or, hey, if I don't see this amount of effort, it's going to be a no for me, you know. Um, maybe not all companies see it that way, you know, but at the same time, you know, if a company says no, that's okay. That doesn't mean you're not meant to be in the fishing industry, whether it's as an influencer or tournament angler or guides or whatever. Just means that, hey, I need to go back, regroup and say, okay, well, how should I approach the next company different? Agreed. And uh, the last thing here, too, is tell the folks where to find you guys as far as social media, as far as your website. You know, where can they look up Jigmasters? Yeah, you know, so, um, you know, on Instagram, it's very simple. It's just at Jigmasters. Uh, the Facebook page is uh, at Jigmasters Tackle. And then the website is uh, Jigmasters.com. Um, you know, so it's all, you know, all fairly simple there. Um, but yeah, you know, and obviously one of my big things too that I really try to do that some companies don't is if you're struggling, 
you know, hey, look, man, I bought some of your flipping jigs. What am I doing wrong? You know, I want to kind of try to help to talk you through that. Is it always going to work perfect? No, I know I'm not fishing your body of water, but, uh, you know, typically I can give you some good pointers on, hey, look, you know, you're fishing gin clear water and you got this color that's not the best color for that. You know, I want to help. And if you're not sure, please don't place a big order of just for giggles here. You know, let's say you're fishing a hundred foot deep quarry. Please don't buy a bunch of buzz baits. Right, you know, right. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're not sure on what to get, shoot me a message through the customer service page, um, or you know, reach out to me on one of the social media platforms or whatnot, and uh, you know, I'll try to help you out. And that's huge. And I again, I can't stress it enough. The companies that I feel like people need to support local, which I love. You're from Ohio, by the way, but local guy just doing it out of the garage, actually putting out jigs and offerings that are different than what you're seeing out there normally on the market, customer service, all that kind of stuff that's just intangible that I can't stress enough are the companies that I think probably we as anglers need to support. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, We're looking forward to having you on again someday soon and go head over to jigmasters.com. Um, head over to Instagram, Facebook, whatever, check them out. It is um, at Jigmasters on Instagram, at Jigmasters Tackle on Facebook, and Jigmasters.com. Thank you so much, Cody, for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Really love doing it. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2020. Please subscribe to Tackle Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.